I had a real case uh, just a few weeks ago that I'm going to take everyone through, which just kind of fit into this perfectly. It's a case that made, made me sweat. It's kind of one on my nightmare list of scenarios. Um, so I, th I thought it would be useful and maybe even a little bit fun to take everyone through and see what people would do. Ah, oh, the phone rings, that dreaded red phone. Okay, so you're walking by, you're going to pick up an EMS patch. Okay, so here's your EMS patch. This is a PCP crew uh, who just got called. Uh, we have a chemical explosion at a factory, at a waste, at, at a waste factory. Uh, two casualties, two people down. We got a black male in our truck who's unconscious, and we're racing to, to, to Vic right now. Uh, the hazmat scene took him, extracted the patient, um, but he uh, still remains unconscious and will be there in six minutes. A little bit more information, right? Usually on the patch, they give you vitals. So victim number one is the one who's actually in this ambulance. Black male, about 30 to 40 years old. He's unconscious. It's a PCP crew, so they can't intervene too much. Uh, he's afebrile, very tachycardic, having a tough time breathing, hypotensive, and his sats are garbage. Just for kind of ease of, ease of scenario, I have victim number two there in a separate ambulance, but let's say some, one of your other colleagues took that patch, and that's victim number two. Now, you got two patients who are exposed to something, some kind of chemical, chemical explosion. One of them's very sick, another one seems a little better. Are you just going to let them roll into your department? Are you going to stop them outside? What, like, what are you thinking there? So, you know, I guess at this, at this point, it's an unidentified chemical that is yeah. causing severe illness. So you think about decontaminating these people outside the ED, getting okay. PPE on. Um, making sure that anybody responding to them outside is in their full PPE. What type of PPE outside? So, <laughs> with, with this scenario, you know, I think, I think initially starting off with PPE C is appropriate, yep. and then uh, downgrading when you feel more comfortable. I think it's very reassuring that your ambulance attendants are still talking to you and not saying that the buddy's like dead in the back of the truck. <laughs> so, what, if they're, what if they're coughing on the phone? Does that change what you're thinking? Let's say the EMS is... Yeah, I think it does, you know. Okay. I think it does. If they arrive and the EMS guys have been in the truck with this guy for five minutes yep. plus the response time on scene yep. and they're not responding at all, then, you know, I'd be more concerned that it was a local uh, exposure sure. that the, that's not spreading from patient to uh, yeah. bystanders. <clears throat> I think you probably still need to do your due diligence and... Uh, contaminate these as best you can for you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've talked about decon now. That's a big issue. We've talked about PPE. We've talked, now we talked about other teams to notify. We want nurses, RT, IV equipment, all that sort of thing. LHSC decon plan, what, are we going to activate a, a, a disaster plan immediately? Or are we going to wait? Or is this enough patience to do it? This is Joel's slide from, from last week with the LHSC decom plan. So we have under, under five patients, right? So we don't necessarily need to wake up pedal in the middle of the night yet. Um, there's gonna, we're going to decontaminate these people outside of the ED. Choose our level of PPE. Joel got it right. So in this case, we have a level C. Uh, we have a chemical exposure. So we want level C PPE. Uh, which is going to give us an, um, a filter uh, to breathe air through, and it's also going to give us a non-encapsulated uh, suit. So that's what we need for, for chemical exposures. And not everyone in the ED needs to be wearing this. This is people outside who are doing the decontamination before patients actually enter in. In terms of what sort of things stay outside and what comes in, well, the patients get washed outside and decontaminated. You've you got to remove everything except the vital things. So you're not going to pull out, you're not going to extubate them before they come into the eMERGE. You're not going to pull out any chest tubes and you're not going to pull out any IOs because that was put in obviously because they were tough vascular access. Everything else, including regular IVs, need, needs, to, needs to come out. So you got this patient in front of you, EMS just drops them off, wash them off from your um, outside, pull out, make sure they're completely stripped down, pull out anything that's not essential. Now we're going to bring them into the department. Okay, so we got our arrival to the emergency department. So what else do you guys need to know about the case. It's in the afternoon, daytime hours. Two victims were on scene. So patients are out in the department. This is handover from the medics. You have workers who are at a waste disposal plant. We're unloading a tanker truck. And some unspecified chemical that you don't know uh, combined with some organic material and so this ferocious plume of gas just erupted. Guys, uh, two, two, uh, one victim collapsed right away. 
second victim went in to get victim number one, and he collapsed himself. So that, that's how he ended up with, with, uh, with two victims. So that's ha handover. On arrival to the emergency department. Were those, they were wearing PPE at the time? Yeah, so we, we don't know exactly what type of PPE, uh, but the, the workers on, on site were wearing something. Um, but unfortunately, guy number one went down after this plume went off. Guy number two goes in to get him. He collapses himself as well. So that's all we got. No specific chemicals yet. So here's victim number one. He's the, he's the sicker guy. We'll talk about him first. He had collapsed on scene about a three-minute exposure before he was extracted. So he's in the ED about half an hour later now. Here's his vital signs. GCS of six or seven. Modeled blue appearance. Difficulty, difficulty, severe difficulty breathing. He sounds wheezy just from the edge of the bed. What are we going to do? The biggest issue with him right now initially is his airway is a problem. His sats are 80%. He's modeled in blue, so he's cyanotic looking. Uh, he's got obvious sort of respiratory distress with his wheezing, <coughs> and his GCS is low, so I would like to intubate him uh, fairly so quickly. Okay. Um, you know, and try to make sure we can improve his saturations and so on. Yeah. Obviously, we need to make sure that we have access. If we have an IO, we should be giving him fluids. Yep. Um, it sounds like there's a burn issue or a flame or something like that. We'll get to his exam. You don't see any obvious burns at first at all. So this case presented to a, to a community emerge actually. So anyone who, who's doing restricted registration who works in these small community departments, this is just your nightmare scenario, right? That you that you can imagine. You got two patients coming in, one of them critically ill with some unknown exposure, and this guy's half dead in front of you with some exposure. You don't know what it is. You can your mind can go in a ton of different directions, but think of that top-down approach, right? What does this patient in front of me need? And Doran's exactly right. This patient needs an airway intervention. So let's, let's, get, let's get our A settled before we start going off in, in other tangents, right? So let, let's intubate them. So patient number one was intubated. Uh, he, victim number two, that's victim number two's vitals. Um, what are you thinking there? So he's, he's sitting up, alert and oriented, um, having some difficulty breathing just from the edge of the bed. Um, so this is the guy who tried to rescue the first, the first gentleman, passed out himself. He seems to be with it now. His sats are all right. He's a bit tachypnic, no, nowhere near the other guy. A bit tachycardic. What are we going to do here? Anything? Knowing that he was exposed to the same thing that victim one was, yep. and victim one is looking pretty bad, you would high in suspicion that he's going to go down that way. But yep. right now he's oxygenating okay, it looks like. Well, 91% not yep. great, but, uh, and he's wheezy. Just you know, ventilin and atrovin, yeah, see if that'll help him uh, with his uh, bronchospasm. Sounds great. Right. So what was actually done, um, so uh, Doran talked about um, victim number one, intubated for his decreased level of consciousness, hypoxia, respiratory distress, Tomidate and succinylcholine were used. Here's his post-intubation vitals. Still looking like crap. You have two liters of crystalloid infusing. So that's patient number one. Anyone want to do anything else at this point? Do we need to start lavage for any reason, whole bowel? Any other specific antidotes you guys are just jump into right now? I won't pick on anyone yet. So that, that physical exam number one. Let's take a look at the rest of the patient. So GCS is seven. Pupils are equal and reactive. He's got coarse breath sounds on both sides with some audible wheezes. Heart sounds okay. Abdomen soft. No diarrhea. No emesis. Got 110 cc's in the Foley when you insert that. And he's completely modeled. Got blue extremities. So that, that, that's patient number one. Okay, just keep that in your mind. Victim number two, like we said, had ventolin and atrovent, some uh, prednisone for what it's worth, remains on 100% O2, uh, still short of breath. Vitals are a little bit better. Sats have bumped up a bit, a little less tachycardic, a little less trouble breathing with the ventolin and the atrovent. And here's what patient number two looks like. So again, sitting up, edge of the bed test. Doesn't look horrible, just having trouble breathing. Slight wheezing, but otherwise neuro, neuro exams, grossly normal. Heart's fine, abdomen's fine, he's not throwing up, doesn't have diarrhea, no urinary complaints here. And this guy is, just appears pale and mottled as well. So investigations, now here's both exams where the patients are at. What do you guys want to order? You're in the trauma room with guy number one, What's, what, are, what are you going to send off? CBC lights, bun creatinine, sure. gases, lactate. Sure. Um, chest x-ray. Chest x-ray. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> okay. Quick stuff to come back. Try to do this in real time. So you get your gas back right away. You get your chest x-ray. They just roll this in. Um, so here's, here's the, the guy's actual chest x-ray. He's acidotic. Um, there's his bicarb and his CO2 there for you. I'll tell you his ECG. 
Are, are you happy, Arbo, that victim one, you've intubated him, mm -hmm. and he's still saying 83%? No. So what kind, of, what kind of things go through your mind, and what are you going to do with this guy in the recess room, intubated, 83%? Um, just kind of move on. So, no idea what's yeah, the kind of things you think about. Um, and when they go in and they collapse suddenly, you think about like a hydrogen sulfide, but usually that's kind of self-limiting when they come out. So you think about a concomitant uh, cyanide or carbon monoxide um, exposure. Um, sure. The common things, you know, it's probably other kind of weird stuff that I'll learn about hopefully by May. Um, and, <laughs> You could start uh, hydroxycobalamin on spec. Um. Okay, yeah, so you got a half dead guy in front of you. His yeah. Sats are still crap. You've intubated, but obviously he's not working. And the other thing is that he's hypotensive, so you'd want to look at starting pressors. Cyanide kit? Who wants to start the cyanide kit? You got you to act on uh, this. I, 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 I do the hydroxycobalamin, not the cyanide kit. I do the hydroxycobalamin, not the cyanide kit. Hydroxycobalamin? Just because we don't know about the cyanide and carbon monoxide. Sure. So just okay. to be safer. What are you going to do for this guy's sats, though? Would you give this guy hydroxycobalamin? Um, well, we haven't given him mental yet. We can give him mental now, too. Um, but I'm thinking make sure that your tube's in place, do all those things, check the circuit. Um, is he uh, any signs of a new mode? Um, we need a chest tube. So we didn't say that right earlier. We need to rule out a traumatic cause of all this because he, he would, some kind of explosion. You don't know what sort of trauma he was exposed to. So this guy comes in, you're immediately thinking, all right, chemical toxicologic stuff, but don't forget your basic trauma assessment, right? All right, here's patient number two. Gas and x-ray came back pretty quickly there. So that's patient number two. Anyone want to tell me what they think of that x-ray? So this patient looks like he's in a lot better condition. He's got good, good, uh, ins good inspiration. Um, you know, you can see a good amount of lung slit compared to the last one. Okay. Victim number one, let's, I'll give you some more stuff. Here's what comes back, right? You're, you're doing all the changes with the ventilator, making sure there's no other reasons, obvious traumatic reasons for hypoxia. Um, bicarb's 10, otherwise lights are fine. Kidney function's a bit off. CBC's okay. CK tropes come back negative. Lactate's 14. Victim number two, here's his stuff. Um, blood work is a lot better. Lactate's only two. And same labs are pending here. Victim number one, so it's been about 40 minutes since you intubated this guy. Uh, you're giving him, you've tried your vent stuff, you've given him bronchodilators, not improving. Uh, still having, re still in severe respiratory distress, uh, still decreased GCS. So this guy's still hypoxic, hypotensive, bottled. What are we thinking of? So Arbo kind of mentioned a couple things, right? Cyanide, hydrogen sulfide. What else, what else could be going on here? This guy still looks like crap. He's still half dead in front of you. You haven't really done anything for him yet. Carbon monoxide we talked about. Anything else that's popping into people's heads? Methemoglobinemia? Methemoglobinemia because it's refractive saturation. Yeah, you have wheezing and a chemical explosion. What else could this be? Organophosphate exposure. You don't know if that's the case, right? Chlorine, sure, okay, your irritant, irritants, that's right. So what's our, the differential I came up with here, you have your two classic knockdown gases, which are uh, cyanide and hydrogen sulfide. Organophosphate toxicity is just based on the fact that both these patients are having trouble breathing. Carbon monoxide, pulmonary irritants, or asphyxiants, and methemoglobinemia, those are kind of, that's about as extensive as a list as I came up with, right? Um, how do we figure it out from here, right? I mean, this is, this is daunting. Picture yourself by yourself in four counties or Wingham, wherever you work. You got this guy in front of you. Here's, here's your differential. There's a lot, your mind can go in a lot of different directions, right? And you can get fixated on certain things of the case, but break it down into manageable steps is, is hopefully what I, we can do from here to narrow this down to one thing, which it really has to be. So if we start working on our, on our differential, I'm going to compare each of these six entities just based on, on a number of different factors, right? If we start with carbon monoxide, they, in your head, what are the sources of carbon monoxide? Where does it come from, right? Combustion is the big one, fires, um, home heating systems. This patient really wasn't exposed to that. There isn't any history of a fire at all. They just had some sort of chemical gas explosion and then these guys went down. Carbon monoxide acts right away um, within, within a matter of minutes. Um, skin changes, what, do, what happens with people with carbon monoxide, right? They get, they get red. Um, doesn't typically smell, and there wasn't really any history of a smell in this case either. 
Uh, oximetry uh, is an important one here. It's going to be falsely elevated because our regular oximeters can't tell the difference between regular hemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin. And what are some general clues? Well, you got to, for carbon monoxide, you've got to look at the history and a CO level, right? So if we look at our irritants and asphyxiants, I kind of combine these. It's, it's a bigger topic. But where do they usually come from? Again, combustion, cleaning products. Uh, a lot of industries and labs use, um, use these as, as reagents in their reactions. Um, in terms of asphy asphyxiants versus irritants, the asphyxiants usually, they really only cause their, cause their symptoms just based on the fact that you're decreasing your FiO2 and the severity of your symptoms will depend on what your FiO2 is. So if it remains at 21, you'll be fine. The lower that goes, you start getting mental status changes, difficulty breathing, chest pains, dysrhythmias, and then eventually coma and death, right? Um, in terms of your irritants, now they're actually causing mucosal damage, damage inside of your lungs. Uh, so people there will, uh, in terms of skin changes, will present with hopefully upper airway, edema, conjunctivitis, irritation, burning sensation, uh, of which these patients didn't have. So that's the big clue there. The, Oximetry, you can't really rely on too much here. It's variable depending on what kind of lung damage uh, has already occurred. With your asphyxiants, it should be normal if you take them out of the environment. And with your irritants, again, it's going to be variable depending on what's happened to the lung. So organophosphates, pesticides, you have your classic sludge and the, the three killer bees syndrome. These guys don't really fit that. They were wheezy at first, which, which can throw you off, but didn't quite have everything else to go along with it, right? The salivation, lacrimation, defecation. Um, skin changes are usually just leaky. You talk about that garlicky odor. I've never, anyone ever smelled this before with organophosphates? No? All right, me either. So you, you can't really rely on, on the odor there, but that's the classic one that comes out. So that's our organophosphates. So what this definitely is not, we got this guy still hypoxic, can't breathe, in a coma in front of us. We've kind of ruled out these three things out, out of our list of six. It's not carbon monoxide because your saturations aren't falsely elevated in this case. This guy is, no matter what you're doing, they're just not coming up. So it can't be carbon monoxide. If you think about our pulmonary irritants, well, they don't really have any upper airway changes, no burning, no edema, um, no soot, evidence of soot. So I, I don't think this is a pulmonary irritant case. And with the asphyxia, I can't say that word, asphyxiants, they're now out of, their, out of the exposure. So that just should get better with oxygen, but this guy's not. Organophosphates, just incompatible toxidrome. So I think we can cross that one off of our list as well. So that leaves us with three things on our differential. Cyanide, sulfide, and methemoglobinemia. Knowing this, what would you do with your PPE? Do you need, what kind of PPE do you need for either, any of these? Say it out loud. None. Absolutely. Um, sulfide and cyanide, they're not transferred with the patient. Methemoglobin just depends on what's, with the agent causing it. Um, so you don't need to wear PPE. These, these are kind of just for interest sake, classically the off-gassed or transferred toxins where you do need to continue personal protection in the department. Um, cases of oral cyanide ingestion, once patients become symptomatic, I had, I had a case recently of a, of a woman who ate, uh, accidentally dad had, her dad who has cancer had some bitter almonds laying around the house for alternative therapy. No evidence for that, Danny. And uh, took, she took like 15 or 20 of these, just thinking they were regular almonds, and then realized afterwards, like, hey, these don't taste right, and then did some Googling and found out she actually ended up ingesting cyanide. So these patients, potassium cyanide is what's actually in there. When, when we ingest potassium cyanide, it reacts with hydrochloric acid to produce cyanide gas. So if someone with an oral ingestion of cyanide comes in and is having symptoms, if you talk to a toxicologist, that'd be, that'd be a reason to continue wearing uh, PPE. And the other uh, common one is phosphides. These are, we, have, we don't see a lot of these, but they're, they're um, very commonly used as rodenticides. There's a case in, in Denver just a couple years ago of some family who put these little um, aluminum phosphide tablets around their house to kill off some rats. And then three days later, their children presented to the eMERGE and cardiorespiratory failure and both died. And then this was ended up being the cause because it releases phosphine gas. So this is, if someone has an, an ingestion of uh, zinc or aluminum phosphide, phosphides, that's something you got to maintain PPE for. But other than these two things, you don't really need to maintain precautions, that, just other than your basics. So now we got three things left, cyanide, sulfide, and methemoglobin. What is it out of these three things? I'm going to talk about cyanide, sulfide, uh, sorry, hydrogen cyanide and hydrogen sulfide uh, together, just because they, pathophysiologically, they're very much the same. 
where they come from, cyanide uh, from combustion, so we were right in thinking about fires earlier, that's where you're going to get cyanide, medications, and food sources. Sulfide is usually decay, Nat um, natural sources, can be industrial. In terms of their onset of action, both immediate. Arbo said earlier that these, these are your typical knockdown gases, right? You, you breathe these in in any sort of concentration, you're going to go down pretty immediately. Uh, they both halt uh, your electron, electron transport chain. You don't produce any ATP, you go down. Skin changes here, they're the same. Neither of these cause cyanosis because you still, your, your lungs are still working. You're putting oxygen in, in your blood. Um, but they don't, they don't make you blue in and of themselves. You get the cherry red finding late for similar reason with your carbon monoxide, right? Just because you're not utilizing your oxygen, you get increased venous oxygen saturations. Odor, bitter almonds for cyanide. I've never smelled those. I think only 20, 30% of the population can smell that. Hydrogen sulfide, this is your classic rotten eggs, which everyone will, will recognize. Oximetry in both these cases should be normal again too, right? And I'll, I'll talk about uh, more specifically why. And clinical clues at the bottom, you got high anion gap metabolic acidosis in both elevated venous saturations and a ele really elevated lactate over 10 specifically has been shown to be pretty sensitive for, uh, for severe cyanide toxicity. In terms of methemoglobin, common things for methemoglobin, you get your meds and chemicals, um, fires, genetic causes of methemoglobinemia. In terms of onset here, it's really dependent on what you're exposed to and for what length of time. It can be sort of immediate, but effects are, all, uh, are delayed as well. Typical finding here is cyanosis. Uh, no obvious odor unless you know what, what the patient's inhaled. Uh, oximetry use tends to stay around 85%, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. And the big clinical clues for uh, methemoglobinemia would be your classic saturation gap, so the difference in saturation in your um, venous, your venous, your saturation on oximetry and your saturation on your blood gaps, chocolate brown blood, and then you can order a methemoglobin level as well. So if we think about our two knockdown gases, we've kind of compared all of our differential on, on a number of factors. Cyanide, well, if we start treating cyanide, especially if we use the cyanide kit, we're going to have, treatment of this is going to have a horrible effect on treatment of, of something else. So if we're going to initiate this, we've got to make sure that we, we have the diagnosis right. In terms of sulfide, Arbo mentioned this again, we've taken the patient out of the exposure. If we're giving them oxygen, they should get better, but in this case, they're not. Um, patient number one, they both kind of fit this. They both went, went down, breathed something in, went down right away. Why is it not cyanide? Well, guy number one, he's sick, but he's still alive, right? Cyanide is usually pretty lethal pretty quickly. And this guy's cyanotic, which doesn't really make sense because cyanide, you still have normal oxygenation. Hydrogen sulfide, for the reasons I just said, we've taken the person out of their exposure. This should get better. No one ever said anything about any rotten eggs at any point. I don't think this is cyanide. Yeah. Just to, just to go back to your other point there. Oh, you actually may bring it up on that slide. I don't know. Yeah. Um, with respect to therapy, or, uh, kind of empiric therapy for cyanide toxicity. Yeah. So I, I think that that's a bit of a, a, a broad statement because you're saying, should I give the cyanide kit? Yeah. And that entails a couple of different therapies yes. as opposed to treating for cyanide empirically of which hydroxycobalamin was yeah. mentioned Absolutely. and I would have given him hydroxycobalamin. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure that would have a deleterious effect on his true. toxin. Exactly. And the same can be true for the cyanide kit, whether or not you're inducing some type of methemoglobinemia or not. So you have your nitrites and you have your thiosulfates yep. as part of that kit. And you'd probably be okay with the thiosulfates, not that you want to use that in a hypotensive patient necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm not sure, and maybe you're going to address it just with your pathophysiology or not. But um, I don't <coughs> think empiric treatment for cyanide would be such a bad thing. Yep as long as you're not inducing methemoglobin. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that, that, thanks for mentioning that, Drew. That, that's really the point I, I was hopefully going to get, get to in that depending on what, how you treat your cyanide, you can have a, have a positive effect, right? And if, if you give the hydroxycobalamin, you're not going to be ruining treatment for something else or making the patient worse. So cyanide and sulfide, here's how they actually work. They just, they, they block a cytochrome in your electron transport chain. You no longer make ATP, so your oxygen isn't getting used up. So you get elevated oxygen levels because your body's not using it. Um, the difference between cyanide and hydrogen sulfide with how they bind, cyan, they, they both like methemoglobin better than regular hemoglobin. 
but cyanide is spontaneously reversible. So this is why cyanide, uh, sorry, uh, sulfide poisonings are, hydrogen sulfide is spontaneously reversible. So that's why if you get a hydrogen sulfide poisoning, you take them out of the environment, they should get better because that will spontaneously uh, break off. So one more hint that I actually got a few days after the case, which is funny. It's amazing what you can find on Google News, but this is the actual uh, news article that was written about what happened. I've, I've whited out any indicators of where this was or what the company was because there's an ongoing investigation that I have no intention of being a part of, let's just say that. So um, here, here's the actual news, <laughs> news article. So they had the, the reporter here said nitrous oxide was released. It's, that was actually nitric oxide. Uh, that ended up being, uh, being the chemical. Now, we didn't know this in, in the department, but these guys were pouring something out, two things mixed together that shouldn't have, and they ended up with that big yellow cloud uh, above the company. Um, <laughs> so, and then you had, the Emerge ended up with those two patients, and it was a little small community Emerge right near here that ended up with both of these patients, right? So I, I, had a, I was on toxicology, I had a frantic doc on the other line of the phone, not, what the hell do I do with this guy? Oh my God, you gotta help me out. And, well, it was interesting, that's for sure. It made me sweat, and I wasn't even the one in front of there. So what does this have to be just based on process of elimination? Met hemoglobinemia. And this is something that I initially wasn't on my differential for an immediate knockdown gas because it typically doesn't tend to do this unless concentrations are super high and people are exposed for, for quite a long time. This ended up being, uh, I think, 97 or 98% concentrated nitric oxide that was released. Uh, and this guy had a, about a two or three minute exposure before he was pulled out. Uh, so that explains why he went down. That explains why the second guy who went in to grab him also went down, because this was just super concentrated stuff. I mean, that, that plume of gas looked nasty. So what are the clinical clues here? Well, cyanosis is not improving with supplemental oxygen. Our saturation gap, which is the saturation on our oximeter, minus the sat on the ABG, and I'll talk about why that's different, and chocolate, count, chocolate brown colored blood. These are kind of three, you see these three things, it's got to be met, met hemoglobinemia. So what is it exactly? I'll just go through it quickly. It's an ab, it's, it happens when you have, form an abnormal hemoglobin complex. Your iron gets oxidized from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. You, this happens in our bodies all the time. We're constantly exposed to oxidant stress, and our body is generally pretty good at dealing with it. We have enzymes that reduce the, the iron back, and usually a, a met hemoglobin level in a healthy person is under 3%. Um, can't, met hemoglobin itself cannot bind oxygen, and it also inhibits the release of oxygen from normal hemoglobin. So you end up with severe cellular hypoxia when you, when you, when you have induced met hemoglobinemia. General causes, there's a hereditary stuff for any, anyone who's doing pediatrics. And then there's all the acquired causes. And I think the, uh, Murph was telling me there was a case a few years ago from, uh, I want to say the GI suite from endoscopy. Did anyone see that one? That was secondary to benzocaine. It's treated two or three of them, probably about 10 years. Yeah. With, the, uh, with the topical hurricane sprays as well. Absolutely. OK. Uh, so the common medications that we might see, dapsone, nitrates, and benzocaine. Um, in terms of chemical agents, uh, any of the nitrogen stuff, so uh, all the nitrous gases and dyes, and then it can also be released in fires from the um, uh, combustion of, of various things. Clinical presentation, it really depends on what your met hemoglobin level is. Right? Far and away, the most common symptom of it is cyanosis, um, and you get that at levels of about 10%. And as your met hemoglobin level starts to climb and climb and climb, you end up with these symptoms here. So it starts off with just some trouble breathing, maybe some exercise intolerance, headaches and weakness. And as your met hemoglobin rises, you get into severe problems like seizures and dysrhythmias and CNS depression and death. So it, it can be pretty bad. Cyanosis is absolutely the most common physical finding. It's, all, it's weird because it's often completely out of keeping with the rest of the patient. You have someone who's sitting in front of you blue, makes you worry, but they otherwise look not too bad. Uh, people who have underlying lung or heart disease are at increased risk of developing symptoms just based on the fact that they don't have the same protoplasm. Antidote, methylene blue. So this is what we, this is what, um, we advised the, the doc over the, over the phone to give. We didn't have a met hemoglobin level back yet, but just through doing a doctor house style differential, and let's break it down, Okay, we came up with methylene blue. This, is, this has got to be it, right? So <laughs> I knew an Indian one. I don't know. But, um, so how do we dose it? It's a milligram per kilogram over five minutes. 
and you repeat it if your cyanosis isn't improving. You want to give at most 7 milligrams per kilogram per day because methemoglobin, it's, methylene blue itself is an oxidize, oxidizing agent, so you can make things worse with it. What kind of bad, what things do you worry about when you first give it? What can you expect? Maybe not worry is not the right word, but what do you expect? It's going to drop initially because I think it's actually the dye itself causes the saccharum to misread. Exactly, right? So you, you, uh, you, you have to warn, uh, if, if you yourself are giving it, be wary of it, but if you're telling someone else to give it, you have to let them know that's the potential side effect. Because this guy is, you have this guy on the other side of the phone who's trying to fix this guy with severe hypoxia, and now you're giving him a med, and he sees his sat just drop even more. So make sure you warn people about that, because it is a dye. Um, other cautions, um, people's urine uh, turns kind of a bluish green color. It can be a little irritating on injection, but otherwise it's a, it's a pretty well tolerated medication as long as you stay under the, under the maximum dose. Quickly, how does it work? Well, here you get your normal hemoglobin with your, with your iron, gets oxidized. Methylene blue from, with an enzyme in your body gets um, oxidized to leucomethylene blue, which gets reduced back to methylene blue, and as it's getting reduced, it takes the electron away from, uh, from your iron, so you end up reducing uh, your Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus. Now, you need NADPH to make this reaction happen. So one of our patients was, was black, and I put that in for, for an obvious reason. Who don't you want to treat, or maybe be a little more cautious who you treat with methylene blue? Right, G6PD. Now, that, that, that's kind of a classic exam question. In, in a real life scenario, there is hundreds of different phenotypes of G6PD, and most people, unless they're wearing a bracelet and know it beforehand, ha even if they are G6PD deficient, have enough of it to produce NADPH that you're not going to make them a lot worse with this. But specifically, what populations do we, do we think about with severe G6PD deficiency? Mediterranean descent? and African, so that's why I, I put the, one of the patients was black in there. So what are the indications for using methylene blue? Well, significant hypoxia, or just an absolute level greater than, greater than uh, 25%. Um, contraindications, G6PD, which just talked about, and at really high doses causes hemolysis. So if we go back to patient number one, repeat doses of methylene blue, I think in total this patient received four milligrams per kilogram in, in the eMERGE. Initial level returned at 52% for victim number one. So this is why victim number one was as sick as he was. It was a short exposure, but high enough concentration of this stuff. His methemoglobin level was, was super high. He went down, victim number two. Uh, his level ended up coming back at 22. Both these guys were otherwise young and healthy. Victim number one, I got a call back after they had uh, treated with methylene blue blew a few times, and that is, SATs had only really come up to about 90%, still requiring an FiO2 of 100% on the ventilator, so they thought something else was going on. If you remember the x-ray there, it showed some kind of diffuse uh, pulmonary edema, ARDS kind of picture. So in, in the intensive care unit, this guy's actually still there, uh, sedated with propofol and fentanyl, still on some pretty heavy vent settings. Labs have all normalized, his carboxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin levels have, have come back down. CT is fine, no intracranial stuff, but remains, remains really sick. And here's his latest uh, chest x-ray there. So now we, got our, we fixed our methemoglobin problem. So what else is going on? Well, nitrous oxide in and of itself is actually a really highly reactive gas. Uh, it's when it comes into contact with air in a respiratory tract, it produces nitrogen dioxide. And nitrogen dioxide just induces badness everywhere in your lungs, bronchitis, diffuse inflammation, fibrosis, acute lung injury. It's, it's, it's a really bad gas to, to breathe in. So unfortunately, this guy had high, high, high concentrations. So he's, he's got diffuse lung injury now from, from the nitric oxide exposure. So remains intubated. It's really just supportive management from here out in. I mean, we've, we've done our acute stuff, so hopefully he'll be able to wean off the vent at some point in the near future. Victim number two did really well. Uh, advised methylene blue um, right away. He didn't get a level back yet. He was discharged home after, uh, after a single dose. His initial level was 22. He had absolutely no sequelae of, of his uh, toxicologic exposure. So that, that, was, that was good news there. Be cool. Samir, in your cases where they have the bracelet or whatever, you know they're full-fledged G6PD, are there any alternatives to methylene blue? Transfusions uh, are one, exchange transfusions. Um, uh, that's, that's kind of the main one that I would, that I would go for. 
or try, I'd, I'd be getting someone else involved at this point. Um, <laughs> shoot, I'm, I'm not about to start that by myself, but um, that, 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 that's the biggest one talked about in the literature that I know of. The only other transient one might be hyperbaric oxygen just to buy it sometimes. Absolutely. So what are our closing remarks here? Well, preparedness, I mean, Pedals and Joel probably hammered this home, home last week, but being prepared for something like this and practice, practicing it is just absolutely critical to the success you're going to have when the situation actually happens. Um, you know, this was a, I can't say it enough, this was a little small community emerge department right near this toxic factory, and any one of us working uh, restricted registration shifts could be faced with with a case like this. Um, so it, it's have, have your basic disaster medicine isn't taught extremely well. Hopefully that no, that's definitely changing uh, changing now that, that uh, the pedals heavily involved. But be prepared and uh, practice as much as you can. When you have someone critically ill, think of the easy things first, right? This guy initially came in. He's looking like crap. He's exposed to something we don't know. Well, just keep it simple. Deal with his ABCs and then just come up with your list of things, right? Your top-down top down approach and just break your management into these, of these complex patients uh, into little small manageable pieces. So that was, the, that was kind of my whole case and that's my experience. So I had this while I was on toxicology and uh, that's how I got involved. And just topic fit in uh, perfectly with, uh, with Joel's talk last week. So I thought I'd be useful for everyone to go through, because it's kind of a rare presentation of, of met hemoglobin. We don't often see people get this sick this quickly from it, but it's got to be, got to be on your list. And that's it. If anyone has any questions, comments. The only thing I'd add is, is just going back to the initial phase of decontamination, yep. it, at least at, at, our, at our sites um, here, in London, if you have someone who's contaminated with someone, something that is potentially toxic to bystanders or the environment, and that includes um, some forms of radiation exposure, then you shouldn't be showering them anywhere in the department. I mean, that shower we have in the hallway of Vic Emerge is, is not contained enough to, to be able to dispose of, you know. <laughs> so it needs to be done, even if it's only one victim, it needs to be done outside. Well, thank you very much, everybody.